<laughs> I'm cold. Nothing like hearing Hendrix just like wing it. You know, Happy on, New a, Year, man. on a on an, a special occasion, but he's just like he's just like yeah. I just thought I can. I just decided to do this. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, he sounded that way about forty percent of the time. Happy New Year. We actually, yay! We actually didn't. We actually didn't do our uh, <coughs> New Year's hug because we were all going forty-seven different directions simultaneously. We were. But Happy New Year's, everybody! Happy New Year! We're here. We were going to do a uh, end of the year respective, and and we decided. We don't even know how we're going to approach a perspective. And it's, I don't think we decided. It, we just went, oh, shit, yeah, it's here. It's and we're not like, ready. Yeah, and so that didn't happen. But but today Joe was asking me, so what uh, What was like, we thought maybe we would pick a, a particular show that either one of us thought was special or something like that. And I couldn't think of anything. And he's kind of threw out a couple ideas and I went, oh yeah, that, you know, but I mean, we realized that. But well, I think it was all like blended together. Yeah. It might not even have been which from the last episode, year. Which episode, which season, which we, we did what? I think we, I think we ended up landing on the one that we could really both remember clearly as a standout was, was, um, was Dave and Joe having a tequila drinking contest and Joe losing badly. And, and but that, that was that was two years ago. And, and yeah, and then everybody left with COVID and, and that was yeah. That was notable for what a train wreck it was. Yeah. I mean it was it it famous last words. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. There was a lot of fun going down. <sighs> till I was down there. But uh um, everybody, how's uh, how's the weather in your neck of the woods? Because here in Los Angeles, it's Man. cold as hell. It is. In fact, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, it's actually it's forty seven here right now. Well, the the rest of the world will laugh at us, but for us, yeah. it's just yeah, it'll cold. and it'll be thirty nine <laughs> tonight, and and. Uh, you guys, yeah, it's 30 below here. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And please feel free to chime in and um, call us a bunch of... Um, Wussies. Sure, yeah. And let and let us know how cold it is. Oh, it's snow here this morning. Five inches of snow. Wow. Oh, in PA, my homeland. Where are you from in, in PA? I was born in Pittsburgh. Um you were born in Pittsburgh, and I was yet born in Pittsburgh. I, I always associate with you with Colorado. Well, that's really where I grew up, but my uh, family's really mm. deep roots in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure cold in New Mexico. Um, and uh, it would be really awesome if you guys were specific about, oh, okay, Quaker Town, about where in these states you are. It's just fun to visualize where people are at. PA in the house, Westchester, hell yeah. Rain in New York City, Albuquerque. Okay, you're in Albuquerque now, or you came from Albuquerque? Um, Brendan is from Albuquerque. Oh, because I have and friends. It's cold there. I have friends in Albuquerque now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chicago. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, um, Ottawa. Okay, John. So, do, are the uh, are oh man, Vancouver. I'm the, moving there in ten years, guys. Are the bean balls a little better now for you, John? I I adjusted them especially for you. Oh, that's yeah, pretty a little great. Little bow, you know. Man, do my last little bit of wardrobe management. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. It's it's uh. Did did Nikotron make that for you? Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. The spitting image. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Indianapolis. Yeah. Be, be nuts, yeah. Isn't that a police much. song? What's that? Isn't that a police song? What? Peanuts. No, that's not the name of the song. That was like the, 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 the vocal going out, going out of the outro. What is? What are we talking about? I know this. It's. 
Peanuts. It wasn't born in the 50s. It was something off the first album. Did they really say Peanuts? They're, or did they? It's the outro of the song, and they're just raging. And there's tubular bells. It's a beautiful arrangement. And yeah. and Sting is in the background yelling, Pee! you know, like at, like at a baseball game. Peanuts! Yeah. Peanuts! And I just listened to that, and I went, okay, these guys are going off the rails. All I right. love this band. I can hardly wait for their next record. Yeah, well... Those guys gave me a reason to live when they came out. I love the police. Yeah. I love the police. That's the big reason I decided I needed an Esquire. Mm. Even though Andy used a telly, I just thought, I'm going to go one better. You know, that's funny. I uh, had a telly Thanks, bridge Rob. pickup uh, neck humbucker telly for a long time, all because of Andy. Uh. And it was, you know, a drunk reverb night. Like, listening to police, like, I need to have one of those. Mm. I had Let's a, rectify this now. I, I bought a telly. Actually, I traded somebody a guitar for the, a telly, um, and it had a humbucker in the neck position. Mm -hmm. And it was a little crooked. <laughs> so I decided I could fix that. So I took the pick guard off, and somebody had carved... The, uh, the the humbucker pick out with obviously a screwdriver and a hammer, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, one of those real hack jobs, and it was all job, whopper jawed, as they say. And, uh, and they tried to even it out and stiffen it by filling it with used cigarette butts. Wow. There was like about 10 of them in there, and I'm like, this is gross. I remember the guy that I bought, he came over to the he came over to my place and he just like reeked like a chain smoker. And I'm like, okay, so he did this. And the only thing he said, oh, yeah, I need something I can to stiffen the pickup up. I got an idea. He goes to the ashtray and just starts jamming in there, puts the pick guard on and goes, okay, now I'm going to sell this. <laughs> that, um, brings a new meaning to that. That guitar is played so much you can hear the beer and smoke. Yeah, and... really. Uh, I don't remember what happened to that, but I don't think I had it too long. Did you mash it on stage? Ziegler. All right, happy Zee new year. year. Jay Z, hot damn. Yeah, kick it. Kick hey, it. How you doing? Um, we're cold. Brian Hansen, no, I don't. Do you guys know anything about Brian Hansen? One of the guitar players from Christian Death? I don't. I don't. I'm only marginally familiar with that band, and I. But I'm ignorant about a great many things. Yeah, I, I would have to say that. that uh, uh, that I do like the name. I'm, I'm intrigued enough by the name to just like. <laughs> well, you know, go look, search man, him out. You're kind of rocking the Exorcist vibe here. I'm I was just trying to give it a little homey vibe, you know, like a little the power dress it up a little bit. You. I I jacked up the contrast on the on the color, the backlighting a little bit, and we got a um, <laughs> we got a, we got a little color in the backdrop, a little additional color in the in the, and then, in and the then, stacks, and then. What you can't see is this actually, it's kind of a candelabra. Yeah. So it's half exorcist, half Liberace. The power of price compels you. That's right. Ah. <laughs> um, I need a little exorcism because yeah. I, I got to kick off the year with um, being sick, guys. Um, you've, been, you've, been, uh, you've been on and off that kick for the last quarter. Last few months, getting. I I came over here once and I thought I was coming down with something and Erico gave me this magical oh. thing that I oh, was slammed. So that worked for you? It it did. Oh, I never man. really got. I, I was feeling run down that evening and I never descended into the sickness. This week was for real. Mm. It wasn't awful, you know, but um, it's still lingering and it's in waves and mm. and I hate it so. Mm. Um, Happy New Year to me. Are you still Are you still rocking the wellness formula? Um, yeah, what's left? I'm absolutely yeah. still rocking it. Yeah, I took two of them before I came here. <laughs> Not kidding. Um, what's called for you, Joe? Am I reading that wrong? Called for you. I don't know what that means. I feel dumb. Um, Rob is asking if we're going to exhibit at NAMM this year, and no, we're not. Um, I'm going. 
Um, so I'll meet you at the food truck or wherever we end up at the bar or wherever. Oh, and, oh, um, oh. Maybe we should talk about... We're talking about doing NAM updates as a part of the MALs. Uh-huh. Right? Right. At the end of the month. Right. And... We're also going to do something new here. Well, we're going to tr- we're we're talking about it. It's it's a um it's like a trial, right? A trial run. We are going to attempt to do the malcontents once a week now. Until we drop dead. Yeah. Or Erico kicks us out of your house. Yeah. Well, we yeah we're trying to work it out to where we can do it every week, but it doesn't necessarily mean we do the full blown production as it were like like it is ever really full-blown but um because of our schedules but we still have all this stuff to talk about all the time and and not a practical way to do it every week right because just because all the stuff that's going on i mean and we both got a shit ton of stuff going on so we thought we might try and i think we will try doing it the a couple of shows a month the old way. Yeah, kind of remotely. I'll be in my place. You in your place, and I'll just do it, sit at my desk with my mic and... and, and Yeah. Can, and and we thought that... Um, desk camera would do it re- remote style like we used to do. On the difference is... Season one. Yeah, the difference is you have bandwidth at your place now. I do. And the other thing is that kind of opens us up a little bit to have more guests on who are in remote locations. Right. Um, when they can't make it here to the to the headquarters, um, so I mean we'll see. Maybe I mean all jokes aside, maybe you guys will decide that um, that's too much and you don't really want to tune in for that many. <laughs> We're just trying and to I wouldn't engage blame you if interest. You'd, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, it's like no, it's not an insult. If we find out that's just too damn much, but. We're yeah. going to attempt it. <laughs> so Stephen says weekly would be interesting, and, I, and my immediate thought was, yeah, until it isn't. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and then it'd be like, yeah. oh. Middle of February, you guys jumped the shark. Yeah, yeah. After Go three, back after to. After three or four of those, I'm sure we'll. Maybe once a month, guys. Yeah, yeah. We'll, I'm, I'm just anticipating how soon it'll take for people to kind of go, yeah, right. Right, exactly. Yeah. And um and Steve, I, I see what you're saying there and I just uh we missed context given the timing. Yeah, it's cold here, but it's what? It's fifty right now? <laughs> or is it 40, has it dropped under fifty? It's forty six. And for us, man. Yeah, forty six, forty seven. Oh, it's forty nine. No, forty seven. That's forty seven. Yeah. yeah. Um so, It's nice and cozy in here though. Yeah. Laugh all you want, guys. Um, <laughs> so we see a bunch of questions coming in. That's great. We're going to do our best to get to all of them. Uh, because you asked for it is our um, semi-proprietary once a quarter episode where people just ask you 8 million questions. Yeah, and I try not to go off the rails answering them. Yeah, and I and sometimes I try and bring you back to earth a little bit with varying degrees of success exactly right. yeah <laughs> sometimes i cut you off when you don't want me to um, uh, yeah well you know i mean um when we talk about the stuff that we want to talk about off camera yeah i just i realized this today the same kind of dynamic occurs between you and me talking about that stuff as it's happened as I experienced in the last band I was in. Hmm. Where no idea where long time buddies. We'd been in a variety of different in and out of a variety of different bands together over the over the span of time. And um, the last time we started rehearsing regularly, it was never really all that clear that we were preparing to go out and and foist that on the. On the public, it was more like was for fun. Okay. And we would sit around and yak and chat and then play a little bit, and then get get ro- and roll into this groove, and go. That was fucking amazing. That was a, what you did, and oh yeah, that thing 
and, and we would record them and listen back and go, that was magical. And what, that happened over and over again to the point where we went, well, we got to go take this out. Hmm. We got to go out and try this in front of people. Mm -hmm. And the same thing would happen with that is like what happens with us where we put all this time and effort and we think we've got all our I's dotted and our T's crossed and blah, blah, blah. And then the shit's turning off and it's echoing and it's squirrely and the sound goes away and uh, it starts chattering, you know, all the things that you guys have, have seen us sort of like stumble through. And it's just like, it was just like that live. Just, I, I would, I would go, okay, if we're going to go play live, that means we have to organize to have a set, you know, so we know what we're going to do. And, and uh, the other guys are going, uh, yeah, well, who, yeah, we should get, we should get a set list together, which implies, okay, who's going to do it, you know? <laughs> and of course, it always fell to me, and I was fine with that. I go on my computer, I open up a spreadsheet, you know, I line up all the songs, and then make big giant text out of it. I work it all out, and I get it, you know, and I go it's over. It's nerdy, Steve. And I go over at rehearsal, I go through all the songs with the guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, put that there. Hey, that sounds good, blah, 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 blah. Okay. We get to a gig, I hand everybody a set list, the drummer looks at it and goes, I don't want to start with that song. Oh, man. Oh, why did you put that in the list? I don't want to do that. It's like, I'm like, right, okay. Now it all comes back to me. Why I stopped playing live gigs with people for a time and then it just <laughs> ended up, it ended up in the meantime, I fell back into going in, into my tech mode and accidentally started an amp company, you know, but... <laughs> but the last memory was, I hope I get out of the rehearsal room without having murdered everybody and just like chopped them up into pieces and left them in the dumpster before I went back home and made macaroni and cheese and watched, you know, <laughs> my favorite TV show or something. <laughs> and it all, all that came back. Okay. You know, and, and uh, there was actually, I read a review of the Cream Reunion. Mm, the one at the O, O two is that the name of the the last reunion they did? You know where? Yeah, they, in London. In London. Yeah. 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 Where, the reviewer, had backstage access to, and he was watching everything, and his his thing was like, like all these emotions and all this time passed and blah 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 blah, and he said, and th it it just seemed like that. Uh, it seemed like, in a sense, they were back, and and also the arrogance was back. <laughs> you know, all the stuff that blew them apart was just still there, like like you know, like flea eggs on the carpet. You know, once the weather gets nice, they come out. And uh, he basically implied that, like the 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 seeds of their second destruction were already built in because they were there at. At, at the beginning, and of course, they didn't learn anything. They they got older, and they had a, they had careers, and they did other things. But when it, they got back together, it's the so chemistry, same brothers in a room. The like, chemistry, yeah, you know, right? Yeah, they never <laughs> they they never worked any of that stuff out. They just like they went their own separate ways. That was how they worked it out. So when they got back and went, they they discovered, oh, we still got we still got this shit to to work out and. But now they're, now they're kind of like this was just f for fun and, and, you know, Ginger Baker's backstage yelling at Bruce for playing too loud and I'm never gonna play with him again and, and blah 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 blah. Yeah, something's never changed. She, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so, um, so, th so that's to that. so that's what we do. We get on this. Oh, this would be great, and we should discuss this and blah blah blah. And, and then we get here and. And then we do a show, and then afterwards we go, oh, you know what we didn't talk about? Well, you know what we're really good at doing <laughs> is feeling incredibly inspired on a Tuesday. <laughs> and then on Friday we'll go, remember that thing? And we'll go, well, I remember a thread of it. And neither one of us can get emotionally associated to it whatsoever. It's like, I don't even know why that was interesting. And we both do that. It's like emotional amnesia towards And I even take these notes. Topics. I Me even too. take notes and make little arrows and things like that. And then I look at it and go, what the fuck was that arrow about? 
I just put an arrow next to a word, and I have no idea why that arrow is there. Yeah, yeah. But so um, we did um, go through a lot of technical um, bullshit last year in this room. Remember that? Yeah. Um, kind of caused us to not do shows for months. Right. And then uh, the last few shows when we came back, we were kind of using a skeleton crew of gear. Mm -hmm. Steve has um, didn't rebuild the, the the computer, but Julian just reformatted everything, wiped everything, started from scratch. Right. Well, I took. I had a newer computer that had a glitch in the USB. That's part. what you had been using. That was I that everything switched was to that. But it was glitchy because right. of the USB clogging up. Okay. And there was a bug for that. And there's, to this date, there still hasn't been a fix. And my previous laptop was the one that we were running the show on before all the glitching started. Uh-huh. So, yeah, Julian wiped that drive because it was slow, which is the reason I got a new one. It was slow and clunky and all that. Well, we wiped the drive and set it up a completely different way. And then... Uh, that was just a work-related thing. Had nothing to do with is this going to work for the show or not. Just that's what we did. Yeah. And um, and then I I uh, so I had these two laptops. One that I used for working at home. One that I used for working at the office. And after we wiped one, and it was so fast and so efficient that I took my newer one and did the same thing to it. And it was nice too. But when I plugged in and all the the show software, it started doing that glitchy thing again. So I went, oh, I don't remember the old one doing that. So I pulled out the old one. Now it's all working fast and, you know, and has tons of memory and all, and all that. It was really wicked fast. Yeah. I put it on and it's not doing that glitch. So oh. we're back to using the original laptop that we were running on the show before, you know, the first uh, two seasons. Okay. And then... Um, there must have been a, a Windows update or something like that that had happened in the interim that had rendered it not working. So I went back to the old one. It's been fine. It's really fast. So it's that's what we're running off of that's, tonight. And that's what we're running off. And Everything we did a whole reset. Of that. The sound is better. The lighting is better. The, the, the cameras interact with it more efficiently than they did before. And... But man, um, we we, we had a tech place. rehearsal last night. Yeah, yeah, and it was. We like, have some special footage from that. We were it, working hard in here. Yeah, yeah, you know? it was. It was. This uh, this was the scene last night. It's pretty great. All right, so here we are. The gorilla fart. <laughs> okay, if we must talk, we're talking now. We're talking. We're talking now. We're talking. We're talking. Sans now. gorilla farts. Sans gorilla farts. I. I learned my lesson. <laughs> I like the gorilla fart. It's a nice touch. You look right now like I feel. I'm using the guitar as a shield against whatever malady you're experiencing. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work, Steve. <laughs> Gotta alleviate the gorilla farts. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, a bunch of people are hanging out in the chat. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Alyssa from the East Coast. Hey, bubba. And, uh, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, gri <laughs> I'm Grizzly Joe, man. Of yeah. The frontier. yeah, you're Grizzly Joe. I am, guys. Look at this. I never did this before in my whole life. I, uh, we, um, were uh, I was Ted Lasso for Halloween. Oh yeah. Did I ever show you that? And uh, and Alyssa was Coach Beard, so she had a beard, and I was Ted Lasso, so I shaved completely and had a fake stash. Oh oh. And when I did it, I went, you know what? I'm just starting from scratch. <laughs> I'm just gonna grow this out for 90 days and oh, yeah? see what happens. Yeah. So at the end of January, I'll be at 90 days. Thinking I might go up to February um, 28th, which is my birthday. Oh, and just so okay. Super so, Grizzly Adams. So you're not gonna you're not gonna do the 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 the, the Letterman experiment. Right? Uh, that, 
you know, this was only supposed to go until the end of January. Now I'm thinking the end of February. So or, anything or Jim can happen. Or Letterman and Jim Carrey. It seemed like they were having a contest to see how grisly they Look, could... man, <laughs> Billy Gibbons is cool. Wow. Billy Gibbons is cool. Maybe it'll help my guitar playing. Just a little bit. <laughs> Not Alyssa goes, no! <laughs> I'm with you, Alyssa. Seriously, I'm with you. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, Amanda, the beard does not somehow uh, bestow upon me craftsmanship skills. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I've never put up a garden shed before. Have you ever put up a garden shed? No. You can build an amp, but have you ever framed and no. drywalled? And... No, I tried, I tried a little bit of drywalling here in one of the rooms. And, and you quit? Uh, no, I finished it and painted it and got it all done and all that. Um, it's When it's done, when you do something like that and you're a rook at it, but you manage to make it look decent, like, oh, I skated through that. Yeah, yeah, baby. And then you're like, look at this, look at this, yeah. take a look at this. And then your real contractor friends come in and they go, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, like a year later, I walk, I'm walk. i walking by the room and I notice these little, these little bumps. I'm going, what are those? And I rub my finger down it and the bumps are, the nails are working themselves out, right? Wow. So it's unnailing themselves. The wood behind the drywall was not that. Power of Christ. Compared. Yeah, yeah, really. The, the, that room needs an exorcism now because oh. the, the the individual pieces are shifting and moving around, but that's okay. That room needs to get torn apart and redone again anyway. Like, that's another pro another project that was going to be last year and now it's supposedly going to be this year. And <laughs> Glasses make people look smarter and beards make dudes look handy. That is awesome. <laughs> All right. Smart and handy? What do you think? Yeah, well, you, yeah, you look like you, you could have a, a, a do-it-yourself show of some kind. <laughs> Today, we're going to lay a new driveway. <laughs> 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 oh, my God, that is awesome. Yeah, well, uh, awesome. should we answer some questions? Sure. And get this show on the road? Yeah. Because we've been getting questions from the very beginning actually i do need my glasses because i'm old okay um first one and, oh and this this sparkling water is going to have to be substituted with something with some more hair on it at some point soon oh man i really shouldn't with my bad feelings yeah but you're gonna i know make me want yeah. a little nip of some bourbon or something something i'm just probably going to have a glass of wine because oh, I'm in the okay mood. all right um, so the, the first thing here I want to acknowledge is, um, and you know what might be cool? Can you switch to the Nico Chan cam real fast? There's nobody there. That's fine because okay. Steven is saying he wants to see me experience the Sig X live. And I know that you aim the camera right at the Sig X. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring that up. And I wanted to make the point that I, that's the one amp in the line that I've never played. Mm. So we really need to kind of put that into the queue in one of these episodes because I'd love to play it on here. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love to spend time with it. So acknowledgement, Stephen. Um, well, let's see, see what I did there. What, did you do something that I... Yeah. Apparently, I muffed it, so never mind. Oh, what was happening? I was trying to do the picture in picture thing. Oh, that's going to take a little bit of practice. I guess so. Yeah, okay. Um, buttons, more buttons. Uh, what's up on this special episode on You Asked For It? Wouldn't it be the new upcoming Ultra Lead? Um, can't say anything about anything upcoming, right? Um, There really isn't anything new to report, and I don't really want to report on anything that isn't really that isn't really have a foundation yet. What's going on on a lot of things is that well, the move got in the way of everything mm -hmm. that shoved everything back probably two months. 
Okay. So we were planning on having um, oh good lord a release arama at the end of Jan at the end of December between November and December. And um, see, there's an embarrassment of riches yeah, coming in here. Yeah, yeah. Madam Enabler is at it. Here's the Willet. Oh my God, we I love the, these. Okay. And then the the oh the Balvenie the, the Balvenie double wood double wood. Guys. Okay. So I have a question for you guys. Which one do you? Which one would you like to see Joe chugging? I can't chug shit. Yeah. Well, uh, just but, have a little tiny. Yeah, you guys select. We got yeah. the Willet. We got the Michters. We got the Balvany, and we got this Jeffersons. I don't even know that. Okay. That's the one that with the cognac finish. That that's the one that is aged on the ships that and travel not around. Not this one. Not this one. Oh, okay. that's not the one. Yeah. Oh. Ocean. This is not the ocean series. That's not the ocean series. Is that the all one? right? Is well, that the, is that ocean the, I drink up already. Is that the the Kitty Lake no, no, no. series? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, we got to vote for the Jeffersons. We got to vote for the Double Wood. We got two votes for the Double Wood. Well, Alyssa's telling me to have the Balvenie, so I think I just orders from headquarters. That's what I'm going to have. Okay. Okay, now we need to go back to um, the questions. Jeez, did I eat anything today? Because I was thinking um, I was thinking a margarita would be appropriate, the first margarita of the year, but... Um, Not for me, friend. On the other hand... Uh, whoa, even more... Uh, I think we've already, we've already. You never tried that one. You never tried this one. I, well, look, it's the beginning but, of the year. We got plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I need to get better. So, um, did did you finish answering that last question I don't about even, new products? I don't even think we started it. Good oh. lord. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's no more room on the table. Here. I, I think Nico Chan's trying to prove a point. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what it is, but. Uh. Um, I think she's tr trying to demonstrate that she keeps bail money in her purse at all times. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so our buddy Wayne, it's nice to see Wayne on here again. Oh, I was just saying about the about the 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 whole release schedule got shoved back between oh, from, yeah. from November December to January February. Right. So there are going to be things that we're going to be talking about. Um, in, within the next two weeks worth of shows. That's great. Um, but funny things are still happening on, on the supplier side where they're, where everything is all locked down, the, the parts are ordered, this and that, and then all of a sudden the supplier goes, oh, yeah, you know what? We misquoted that. It's like the part that we quoted you is double the price. That has happened and um, <laughs> on a key component. Um Let's see, the, the sheet metal fabricator that we use to make all of our chassis, they just decided, hey, you know what? You know what's going on here? I got some news for you. What's the news? Yeah, we're shutting down. And all the orders that you gave us are not going to get made. And uh, that, was, that was nice to hear just before the end of the year. So they're all shut down, and we've been scrambling, going to other suppliers, getting um, those parts back in the production queue again but mm. that that adds time because it's drawings it's specifications it's silk screen files they have to there's a learning curve there where they have to get up to speed which means that we have to review samples again instead of just giving somebody oh, an yeah. order and saying here make a thousand do what you did last time yeah make a thousand of these it's like yeah. no now we need to see a sample uh, of the raw metal and then we need to see the sample after you've painted it and then we need to approve the paint job that you did and now go back and silk screen it and then we need to pr approve the silk screen so that we make sure that you've got everything right and then you can go produce it and give it to us so that's going to take us out to february on a lot of this stuff uh so we'll be talking more about it then and as soon as we have something that moved forward and and since there's 
five or six things in the queue all simultaneously. Whichever one comes to the top first is the one we're going to stop talking about first. Well, that that's the one thing that I was going to say. And we don't know, we don't know what that one's going to be because there's all these ins and outs on every single one of them. But I thought I w I could say this and not get yelled at. Which is just, there's a lot of really cool stuff, very close, that everyone will be excited about. Yeah, so, and it'll be fun, about, right? And it'll make, it'll make, it, it'll, some of it will make appreciating your gear easier and more fun and more useful. And that's there's like another a question thing. kind of about that. But let, let, let's move on to, to Wayne's question. He's asking about uh, the, the current lineup of speakers that you're putting into mm -hmm. cabinets mm -hmm. and combos, um, fry it, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. eminence, fame combination mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so let's just organize this. What are you currently using? And then what have they kind of excel at? Well, we're still using the P 50 E for mm -hmm. the four twelve cabinets and two twelve cabinets. And, in addition, we're using the Fane F70Gs um, for the 212 and 412 cabinets. The fat bottom cabs are the ones that come either way. Okay. The deliverance cabs are only available with the Fanes now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the eminent speakers were specifically designed to be put in front mounted cabinets. Oh, that's right. And the in the past, the Deliverance and the Fat Bottom cabs were both front mounted, front loaded cabs. The Deliverance got con changed to a rear mounted cab when the Fanes became available, because there was a certain old school quality to this to the not only the Fanes but a rear loaded cabinet in and of itself, and so the Fanes speaker really lent itself to the deliverance cab in the rear mounted format and it also worked really well front mounted in the fat bottom cab so that gave a bigger sort of a performance spread between those two models can i put a bookmark in that for a second um, just to define for everyone what what's the basic characteristics difference between front mounted and back mounted? well the biggest thing with the front mounted cab is that you are are able to seal the entire cab you don't mm. have a removable back okay that remove that reduces the amount of air leaks in the cabinet okay and when you've got four drivers pounding away inside of that it's called an air column the the, the, the column of air that's inside the cabinet mm -hmm. the pressure inside the cabinet is equal to the air atmospheric pressure outside the cabinet right. until the speakers start moving mm -hmm. and then that pressure changes Right. So when the in, inside air column, the, when the pressure increases, it's looking for a way out. Mm -hmm. It'll get out through any cracks in the cabinet, any seams between back pieces that screw in. It'll go through the jack holes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can actually put your ear next to a jack hole on a cab that's got two jacks. Mm -hmm. You plug one of them in to, to play the cabinet, and the other one you can hear going... <laughs> that's bananas. You know? Wow. And... Um, so those little things affect the performance of the cab and the speaker. Okay. Uh, it also affects how much power handling they can have because the stiffer the air column inside the cabinet, the more it acts like a shock absorber to protect the speaker from going into excess excursion. So is it so more a feel thing, like how it's interacting with the amplifier than and a it projection is a frequency thing? thing? Oh, and a projection thing. And okay. Yeah, yeah. And, right. um, and then on top of that, the physical construction of the cabinet is different in the deliverance in that the 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 fat bottom cabinet cabinet is a cannon it shoots the sound straight forward it's it's thing is projection and uh detail and tight bottom end and all those kinds of things the deliverance cab is more of an old school vibe and it's specifically designed to be more omnidirectional so when you're standing on a small stage with the deliverance cab, you can stand s to the right or left of it and hear it really you're well. Get some stuff. You out stand of it. on this off to the side, like directly to the left or right of a fat bottom cab. You can't hear anything. That's you interesting. You have to get out in front of it to hear it. So mm. 
the deliverance cab was specifically designed to project laterally more mm. than the fat bottom. Huh. And then with the newer design with the famed speakers, we rear mounted them and and um, ex basically accentuated that behavior so it even does it more and better than it did before. <laughs> so that's why we changed that. And then the Sound City cabinet is another type of behavior that harkens back to the, the, the vintage Hiwat, the classic Hiwat cab, which is uh, ported on the bottom on the rear. It's a vented cab. Mm -hmm. So um, it it releases low end frequency energy out the back, which spreads around the room. Sure. It doesn't just disappear someplace. You really hear that with the Sound City cab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It fills up the room around the cab, right. not necessarily protecting the low out like the front. It's not just like it, but that's interesting you're saying that. It's a, more akin to, like, one like of my favorite amps combo. of all times is a Super Reverb. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's three-dimensional. Right. It's just sending stuff everywhere. Right. So, uh, and in that environment, you absolutely cannot put the P50s. They're a 50-watt speaker maximum. Oh. They have a, they have a, uh, they don't have a plastic voice coil. They have a paper-based voice coil, which gives it a sweeter sound when it distorts. But it's also a formula that can't handle much heat. Mm. So that's why vintage speakers are made with paper voice coil formers. Uh, it's not actually paper. It's a, it's a flame-proof impregnated paper that manages heat better than paper, but not as well as, as the, the plastic formulations. And... Um, so they have an upper limit in their in terms of their power handling capacity. Uh -huh. So that that that's why they're a really rich sounding speaker, but you just can't throw much power at them. So you can't put them in a vented cab, and that's why they have to have the Fane speakers in the Sound City cab, because it's vented on the back, and you're going to throw a lot of low end at them, which is a, the, which is suicide for a speaker of lower power handling capacity. So how long after you uh, took delivery? And approved, all right, we're doing these fanes. How long after that did you go, we're going to redesign that deliverance cap? It's about, oh, probably, well, probably about a year or two, two Oh, years. okay, all right, so there was a, well, a moment see, or two. At, see, at that time, at that time, the this was well before COVID, well before people started just buying dream gear. Yeah. And just the practicality of big cabinets was not on anybody's radar, really. And so um, so we weren't selling hardly any 412 caps. So there wasn't really any much attention paid to that. You weren't but even then, listening to them a lot, probably. They, we, at that point. They, nobody was asking for them. You know, it was just we were busy doing other things that were more productive. So, um, but once we, once we started doing the deliverance two, and okay, this is a refresh of the amp and it's a perfect time to take a, a second look at the cab and how the pair are going to work together. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went, you know, it really, I felt like it had been wanting to be a rear loaded cabinet for some time but there wasn't really any expediency to doing it at that time but yeah. when it came to releasing the deliverance too then it was like okay we're going to do this and this is going to be the cabinet to go with it and that's what we're going to do and we did it and it worked out great okay all right well to kind of wrap up this question i know it's been kind of long but if we're just looking at these speakers the eminence and the fanes and, and you're not placing them in Fryette cabinets, what would you say that each speaker excels at if somebody was just looking at them as a replacement speaker? Well, you see, and that's difficult because we don't, we didn't, we don't manufacture either one of them with being a replacement speaker in mind because that implies then it's going to be in all these different cabinets that you know, I mean, when we first started making cabinets, there was basically Marshall cabinets and Mesa cabinets, and then there was, and then we started making cabinets. There weren't a million. Well, for, and then and then there was the lower 
the lower tier of cabinets where things were all made from particle board, you yeah. know, and they were really inexpensive. Right. And that was about the price band. It was not really about the performance. So uh, these days, uh, usually we get the question, what speaker should I buy of yours that'll allow me to get my cabinet to behave like your cabinets? And the answer is, well, it's the cabinet, you know. It's well, like, then, what, what's, what tires should I put on my car to make, to make my, uh, to make my, uh, um, uh, you know, Acura behave more like a Maserati. And, and uh, well, it's not really as much about the tires as about all the other stuff that the tires are connected to. So I don't really, all I can really say is that, that yes, you can use the P50s in a rear-mounted cab, no problem. Uh, and if you're running a 100-watt amp, you absolutely have to have four of them, and it's better if the cabinet is sealed than vented so that they won't blow. And... And then, as far as the characteristics, the characteristics of the of the of the the P fifties and the F seventies are similar in that mm. they are more balanced harmonically, where they don't have a particular frequency that juts out and like gets in the west, way. Like yeah, vintage thirty. And the bottom something. the bottom end on both of them tends to be tighter and more and more well defined. So, really, the F seventy is the higher performance version of the P50. But it also has a little bit more mid-range presence, okay. mid-range uh, accentuation without being overbearing. So it's still, I mean, actually when, when, we, when we kind of signed off on the F70G, we went back and forth with Fane a few times. And when we finally fi signed off on it, and then we did this AB comparison with, with Two identical cabs, uh, brand new identical cabs. One had P50s and one had F70s, and they were both mounted the same way. And when we A-B'd them, I went, God, they just sound like brother and sister. It was so funny. I, I sort of, I went, well, of course they do. That's how you hear the stuff. So when you tell the suppliers what you want, you're telling them, you're guiding them through this lens that you already have established for a long period of time. So, it, of course, it sounds like the thing that you already have. And all we really needed out of the Fane was to get a higher-powered, higher-performance speaker that you could lay into it more so that we could make a 212 cab that you could use the Ultra Lead with or the Deliverance 120 with without blowing the speakers. That was really mostly what the Fane thing was about. And to get them to make a specifically a more balanced sounding speaker like the P50, which Celestian wasn't really interested in, in discussing <laughs> with us. Well, um, we have a question from uh, <clears throat> uh, on here that is asking you P50 versus Fanes. Um, well, actually, it says chat preferences. I guess, are you putting that out there? Like, what is everybody else like? Most, do they have a preference? You're just thinking that it's it's kind of dependent upon what cabinet they're going in. Absolutely dependent on what cabinet they're going in. But you're a fan of both of them, obviously, or you would not be putting them in your amplifiers. A fan of what? Um, the different speaker models. I'm a, I'm a fan of the product that we designed to put in our product. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't really, that's kind of a funny way to put it. I don't see myself as a fan of our product. I feel, I just see it as like, we made this to do this. And <laughs> it does that. So, of course, I'm happy with the result. I mean. <laughs> uh, well, what I'm saying is you're not picking one over the other. I tend to lean towards the fanes because they have this other little characteristic that I personally like. And what is that characteristic? It's this this slightly more pronounced mid-range. Got it. But that's only when, I mean, gosh. Okay, <laughs> let me give you an example. So <laughs> Helmet has been using P50 loaded fat bottoms forever. Mm -hmm. 20 years at least, 25. And... Um, with Paige, 
I don't present anything to him that is going to throw him off of his game, or I'm I'm not going to throw anything at him that's that's going to be perceived by him as like foreign or like from out of left field. What do you think of this? Because he's not that kind of experimenter kind of person, and a lot of guitar players are not. Yeah. A lot of guitar players, in fact, some of the some of the most widely known guitar players barely know how to even navigate their own gear. And I and we had this conversation we just between you and me we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago that um you know, a lot of players they just kind of stumble up upon a thing that works for them and then they never mess with it because it works for them and they're busy playing their guitar. Sure. And sure. And conversely, the the people that are really gear freaks and get into the nuance of every little teeny tiny thing available to them are not necessarily the guitar players that are out there gigging and touring and writing and stuff like that. They're just guys that are into gear, and there's a lot there's a lot more of those kind of people than there are rock star guitar players that I have. You, which jack do I do I plug this into? Hey, it's really humming. Let me see your guitar cable. This is speaker cable. Oh, it is. You know, it's that. Um, so, going back to Paige using the P50s. Once I got the fanes all dialed in, I thought, okay, this is the thing that that I think Paige would appreciate because. It does this other characteristic. It has this other quality that I think complements our amps because it was designed to have that. And as far as his playing is concerned, I noticed that he does have a little sort of, he pays a, a little attention to the mid-range being in the right place at the right time. And that's why I showed him the fanes because I saw that as he sets up his amp a specific way to get it to behave that way with his cabs. And it's a little bit more mid-focused than you would think listening to him live and listening to his records. Mm -hmm. The people that emu emulate his style and who he has influenced have tons of bottom end and clarity and that's what they think of when they think they of him. All the but what off. he's doing, he's like kind of exploring the the mid-range nuance so I when I I said okay I wonder how he's going to react to these and so he took a pair of them to rehearsal they were rehearsing for their next tour and he came back and he's just like that was just like the icing on the cake oh huh and he didn't really change his amp settings because when his amps come back for servicing, he's got all the knobs marked. Where he didn't change anything. Yeah. He just went, oh yeah, this is kind of like a little more of what I like. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's also got a couple of the P50 loaded cabinets in Europe. So when they tour there, that's what he has over there. And he didn't. He, he goes and does the European tours, and he doesn't call up and say, I can't do I this can't anymore. I can't stand these yeah. cab these old cabinets anymore. I need to get. The fan loader ones for Europe. He didn't say anything like that. He was just like, "Yeah, it went great." Yeah, yeah, sounded great. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I know the answer. So it depends on who you are, what you're listening for, and, and how you want to slice it. And then there's there's eight million ways to slice it. What's the Paul Simon song? Eight. How many ways to leave your lover? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Get a new groove, Lou. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about the new product that works with the power station? Nothing. I can tell you this. Oh, you're going to It's going to be so much fun. You're going to have so much fun, and you're going to blow your own mind. You're going to go, wow, wow. <laughs> you're going to discover new things, and you're going to have a lot of fun with it. And then the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to get a hear from a slew of people going, why didn't you come out with this 10 years ago? Well, you guys weren't asking for another crazy level of shit 10 years ago, you know? You're asking for it now. So. <laughs> uh, it just it just it just so happened that that the way 
gear evolution has gone it this this need arose and we decided that it was it was a need that we were uniquely positioned to address and solve this problem that nobody else will do because they don't make this product and they don't interact with the customers that use it to the extent that anybody else has a solution for this specific question that people constantly ask us about using the power station in this specific sort of way. So nobody else would think of making a product like this, and so they don't. And the only reason we did is because we make the product and we get the feedback from the customers and get feedback about how they're being used and how they would like to use it going forward. And that gave rise to the uh, a typical thing that happens with us all the time, which is our our people bring us a new problem to solve that has that has a that requires a, a unique approach to resolve that problem and not create more problems in the process. So that's what I can say, and I'm excited about it. And you'll be hearing about it soon enough. Uh, John Ziegler asks, where did you move the shop to? Uh, we moved to Chatsworth. Uh, we're off of, um, off of Topanga Canyon, um, um, just a little bit south of uh, the 118 freeway, south of the, uh, um, the Santa Susana Parkway Road, which is the road that goes to the Spawn Ranch, which is where the Manson family lived. And uh, it's kind of in this nice hilly area with, with uh, it's, it's, it's not the, uh, there's trees and raccoons and skunks and, and, and uh, it's nice kind of rustic hilly sort of area. It's really a nice area. It's really nice. And the, the, the campus where our business park is located is really nice. It's really nice and really kept up and it, the building is nice and our unit is really, really nice and everybody's really digging it. Um, and it's a little bit north of and therefore a bit removed from the porn capital of the world part of Chatsworth, which was... I didn't know that about which, Chatsworth. Yeah, yeah, really? it, was, it was really big. And wow. It's not so much because not so much more of it is done online these days, but there was a period of time when Chatsworth was the porn capital. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, and, and there would be electronic suppliers in a business park, and right next door to them there would be, like, uh, yeah. I remember there was a, a electronic supplier that we bought a lot of stuff from, and we would go there and pick pick up stuff all the time and right right next to their unit was this unit that said uh, vivid pictures uh -huh. and uh, if any of you are aware of any of that stuff you know what what vivid is about so um, that's where we, that's where vivid was and you have uh, vivid memories yeah and uh, so Shots you worth. you would see I'd go there and pick up some stuff and I'd come out <laughs> walk to my car in the parking lot and some girl would drive up in a brand new vet and get out of the car all decked out and stuff like that. And a few minutes later, a guy would 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 <coughs> roll in in a broken down F one fifty pickup with three different kinds of tires on it and four different kinds of paint. And like he was the co star, so that pretty much told you all you needed to know about what was going on there. Like you, so when you went to knock to get your stuff, what the guys inside say? Oh, they were just like in their own world. Go know. away! I'm baiting. You go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you dropped that one on me yesterday. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you idiocracy. Know, well, when I worked at after I left Valley Arts, I went to another repair shop called uh, um, Vivid. Uh, yeah, practically. <laughs> um, I went to another repair company called um, Music Tech Services, okay. and they had a location. They were located on, in Studio City on Ventura Boulevard, mm -hmm. right down in the little part of Studio City that's all getting built up with new restaurants and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And right next door to us was a gay bar called the Tandem Club. Okay. And um, uh, so that place was a, a riot on the, on the evenings, but we were never there in the evenings. Uh, 
But occasionally, we would get a pack, a UPS package delivered to our address because they put the address wrong and it was met for the establishment next door. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time. Uh, so the, the owner, he comes in and he goes, what's this? And the, the receptionist goes, <laughs> I don't know. It's just some package that arrived. He's, no, I wasn't expecting it. He opens it up. It was the biggest butt plug I had ever seen in my life. In fact, it was the, only, the first time I'd ever seen one up close. I was like, what the hell is that? You put it where? Oh, my God, no way. And, <laughs> and uh, we just, he took it out of the box and put it on the display case shelf in the front office of this place and just waited to see if anybody would come from the door or the UPS guy would come back and say, hey, you know, we left a box here that we, we, it was probably the wrong address. Nobody ever came back and claimed that it. it was mm. really funny. So it sat there for like two years on the shelf and, and talk about getting off the rails. Okay, what's the next question? Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. This is from Mendel Rocks. I noticed a bit of parallel dry signal when using a noise gate in the PS100 effects loop. Any tips or mods for getting it fully serial? I'm using an amp switcher with the PS100 loop providing effects. Well, uh, the effects loop in the power station is series. And there will not be any dry signal bleeding past it except if you turn the volume pretty much to zero or practically zero. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because there's a reactive load in the box next to all this other audio circuitry. Yeah. So if you basically lambast that load with a cranked high powered amp, it's going to bleed some signal around the box just because the cables are in close proximity to each other. Right. And so, there's just going to be, that's going to bleed into the effects loop a little bit, but it's a very minute amount. Mm. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to play the, the, and it, and it depends on which one are you talking, is it, was that the PS100? Yeah. 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 They tend to have a little bit more bleed because they have more power. Uh, and they also have a switchable effects loop. So there's more signal passing back and forth between the the load and the power amp so that's just kind of the nature of the beast when they when you're running that much current through the speaker jacks um and you have a bunch of cables in close proximity to each other that's just going to happen at low volumes you're going to hear that bleed but at normal playing volumes and or at live volumes or band rehearsal volumes that can't be an issue there's just not that much bleed in order for that to happen and if there is enough bleed for that to be a problem then it could be that um there's a, a ground connection inside there that could be not tight enough or uh something like that something that could be dialed in and tweaked uh at the factory to reduce that if it's if it's excessive and the only way we would know if it was really excessive is to get it, excuse me get it into the shop and have a look at it and test it to see if it exceeds the threshold uh, of the minimum about a noise bleed that is specified for that unit. And it's very, very low. You would have to be practically playing at whisper volume in order to detect that. Okay. All right. Um, next question. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of thirsty. I, I'm, I, I can handle more questions, but I'm getting, I'm getting thirsty. I don't think I don't Get think down it's, with your bad I don't think uh, whiskey is what I'm looking for or bourbon but I, let's uh, let's go on to the next one but I I'm, I'm, I'm going to need I'm I'm going to need to have some kind of a glass of wine or something to grease the skids. Well, the next question is Yes sir. Will the upcoming new Ultra Lead be way larger than the D120? No. No, they're physically almost the identical outside physically same-ish yeah yeah big, no no uh we have a pretty standard large head format that even though they look like 
if you look at the Deliverance and the Ultra Lead and the Sig X from a distance, they look like different size amplifiers, but they're actually practically identical all in size all three of them it's the cosmetics and the way the panels are laid out that make mm. them look like they're different sizes oh, okay all right i mean if you look back here you can see the um you can see the the sig x on the bottom and deliverance above it they okay, look like ready? they're let's go yeah go the other way they look like they're completely now back yeah right here we go all right there's a highlight reel. yeah and see the, the the clx which is the same size as the ultra lead on the top those are all three uh, yes, the same size heads, and that's going to remain. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. I'm ready for the next question. Well, cheers. Cheers. Fruit juice and fruit juice. Mm. Mm hmm. Oh, and here's for you in case you decide oh you need that. Okay. Um, next question. Our buddy Nigel asks, well, he says, I had a VHT fat bottom. Mm hmm. With 8 ohm eminence uh, P50s, and it was wired parallel series like Mesa and Marshall. No, they were 16 ohm speakers because we never made an 8 ohm P50. Oh, interesting. Uh, so the question is other than the stereo option, why do you prefer this wiring in terms of tone? Uh, PE50, not P50. PE50. Well, that's probably an error because. P50 is the P50. There's only one speaker that we make like that for 412 calves, and that's the P50E. So, oh, okay. Probably got the, the E in the wrong position. But we only ma ever made that speaker in 16 ohms and only ever used it in the 212 and 412 fat bottom and deliverance 212 and 412 calves. What about the P50E? That's what I just said. There's only a P50E. That's so there's only one speaker. P50E. Is there a P50 with no E? Nope. Okay. And they were all 16 That's ohms. Right. That's it. There was never an 8 ohm. Okay. Now, uh, they're wired series parallel so that it will land at 16 ohms total impedance. And um, that's the only way to get a single speaker to exhibit the same impedance as four speakers together in the same cab. One 16 ohm speaker, four 16 ohm speakers wired series parallel will yield 16 ohms. So that's done to maintain the 16 ohm impedance. You don't want to put uh, four 8 ohm speakers in series, that'll be 32. There isn't an amp made that has 32 ohms. Consequent, conversely, you don't want uh, uh, four 8 ohm speakers in parallel because that'll be two ohms, like what guitar amp is a two ohm amp, right? So they're either they're either eight ohm speakers and, and Mesa and Marshall, they all do the same way. They're either eight ohm speakers, series paralleled for a total eight ohm cabinet, or they're 16 ohm speakers, series wired paralleled for a 16 ohm cabinet. And all we did was we took the series parallel configuration. Most cabinet manufacturers make the top two parallel and the bottom two parallel and then series those pairs mm -hmm. we make the left pair parallel and the right pair parallel and then the two of those pairs in series this way so with the switch on the back of the cabinet you can break them apart and right. then they become two eight ohm right. sides because there's 60 ohm speakers in parallel mm -hmm. so you have a you can have a stereo enabled cabinet that's eight ohms aside when it's in stereo and when you plug it into the mono jack and set it to mono, it will be 16 ohms. If you plug it, and then the extra benefit of that is, is if you leave it plugged into the mono input and switch it to the stereo function, it will still be mono, but it will be at four ohms. Mm -hmm. So that cabinet is capable of being run at eight, four, or 16, depending on your application. That's why that was done that way. But in general, yeah, I prefer the sound of a 16 ohm cab because I like the behavior. The interaction between the amplifier and the speaker cabinet is is fuller and m more chimey and sparkly to me uh, when it's series parallel. The other thing that series parallel does, and this is really geeky shit, each speaker has a frequency response curve and an impedance curve. Yeah. Each speaker. Uh, 
the impedance curve of each speaker is generally pretty close because it depends on a couple of mechanical characteristics of the speaker um, to create that curve and those don't vary a whole lot. One of them is the low frequency resonance of the entire speaker assembly, the cone, the spider, and the dust cap and all of that have a specific mass and the resonant frequency of that mass doesn't vary much from one cone assembly to the next because the mass is about identical every time. Yeah. They don't change significantly. <laughs> He's looking at me going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm, I'm thinking of this and the time <laughs> that I dressed up for Halloween as a, a full-blown geisha woman. <laughs> and, and I was dressing down a UPS rep who had given us this UPS software to load into our computer and it wouldn't work. And I'm busting his ass about getting this software up and running and working because we're a business that we're trying to ship and we've got stuff to get out this week and it has to go. And we are hung up on this stupid software and I went, excuse me, and I have to go to the restroom. And I went to the restroom and I looked at myself in the mirror and I went, oh, shit. I just can't believe I just did that. I gave, read this guy the riot act as... It's fantastic. As a geisha remember. woman. With the, the, with the... The whole thing would the, have been blown if you would have remembered. The wig. I had a little umbrella sticking out of the top of the, of the wig. There are pictures. And I've the, seen the this. perfect makeup and the... And a really nice kimono with the wooden slippery, the whole nine yards. And I looked myself in the, in the bathroom mirror and I went, you're such an asshole. <laughs> uh, you could have just like kept your mouth shut and like let him leave and then called him later. But no, I had to stand there well. and, and watch him thinking, you know what? I'm about two minutes away from just like calling the psychiatric unit on this guy. Anyway... Um, the, the mass determines the low frequency resonance of the speaker assembly. This is with regard to the impedance curve. And then the inductance of the coil in, in the voice coil in, with, in relationship to the magnet that is driving it similarly don't change much from assembly to assembly. So that inductance rise the high frequency inductance induced rise in the speaker is the same from one speaker to another speaker of the same manufacturer. So the impedance curve doesn't change much, but the frequency response changes all over the place because mm. this is now about the frequency behavior over a wide range of frequencies of the cone and the spider and the voice coil mm -hmm. material and the, and the dust cap material. Those kind of things have enough variation that a speaker curve will have peaks and dips on it, and each different identical speaker will have those peaks and dips in slightly different spots. Makes sense. So what happens when you put four speakers in a cabinet and wire them series parallel, they interact with each other in such a way as to even out those peaks an and dips because they... Of, and it's an aggregate, yeah. right. They, this peak is here, and this dip is here, and the other one has this peak here, and this dip here. But they're so, similar enough that when they're all operating together, it's kind of a cohesive whole. Yeah. It's not like, wow, that's a weird But that's also cabinet. why when you take a good sounding speaker that sounds good in a 412 cabinet and put it in a single 12 cabinet, it's like, what's all this spiky yeah, shit? I don't remember right. all this spiky shit. Yeah. I don't remember that, that rumbling, thumpy, weird crap on the bottom. You put in another one, oh, that sounds much better. Or that's that's why... You know, some people swear, like, look, this is a great sounding cab. When it's time to record my record, that's the speaker. Put the mic on that, that speaker. speaker. That's right. the magic one. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, you know? that's totally legit. Yeah. Uh, want another question? Sure. All right. Um, anyway, on the 2008 era Ultra Lead. Tessie, feed picks? What is feed picks? <laughs> I'll show you some feed picks. No, we're you, not you doing wanna, that. We're not doing that. You want a feed pick? I can, I can have it here by three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going home. Okay, you have um, to, you have to be a, a you have to be a, a Lebowski fan to get that. One. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, on the 2008 era Ultra Lead, mm -hmm. 
Um, is it possible for it to take a quad of KT120 power tubes? And would the heater current be sufficient? Okay. You sent this you sent this question to support already, didn't you? I recognize that question. Oh, okay. Because 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 the Dave, the guy that does tech support, he brought that one to me. And mm -hmm. that just sounds like identical to the one that you already said. So okay. um, it sounds to me like you want me to embellish that answer already, but there really isn't much to embellish uh, because it's going to be because uh, the answer that you got from Dave came from me. So having said that, um, this is a different forum and more people are going to hear the answer. So that's why it's a good question here. Uh, KT120s are a misnomer. KT100s are a misnomer. Uh, KT88s are not. KT66s are not. What the hell are you even talking about? Where's my drink? I want to go home. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, there is was a thing when tubes were being manufactured in the legitimate electronics industry of tube manufacturing, which is that there were um, uh, there were uh, bodies, governing bodies, that determined what the specification of a new electronic device that was going to go to production was going to be called. Just like these days, whenever a pharmaceutical company comes up with a new drug, yeah, they a talk. New drug. They, they, they talk about, you know, they, they have corporate meetings to talk about what they're going to call it and how they're going to present it, and they give that information to the FDA, and the FDA assigns them basically, okay, this is the name that you, the chemical name, if you see ads for pharmaceuticals, there's, there's the advertising name that they use. Right. Uh, you know, uh, and it's always the most weirdly, weirdly generic, yeah, yeah, drug like, sounding. Yeah, like uh, uh, like Newcastle Brown. A, well, but they all have Axe on the end of it. Yeah, Axe Newcastle Brownia. <laughs> or uh, or or China Whiteia, China White Exia. <laughs> um, there's the advertised name that they tr come up with a name that's supposedly easy to roll off the tongue. And I don't know how any of those names are easy to roll off the tongue. But that's the advertised name. And then you see the, the technical name below it in parentheses that's got X's and Z's and Y's and, and right. lots of consonants. It like, seems like yeah. some Eastern European guy comes and generates it's a festival all of things. syllables. Yeah, right. So... Um, but the FDA approves that name, and then that is the name of that product. And there was a similar agency that that um, managed the um, the nomenclature for new tube production. And uh, there was a couple of them. One is called JEDEC, and one was called NEMA, and there's another one called IEC. And these agencies are different because they're usually founded in different countries. Okay. Or by different government agencies for different reasons, for for the military, for consumer use, uh, or you know, in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, in China, Japan, all these different places. And so there's all these were all these agencies, and they still are there. They conduct their business with regard to current new electronic devices that are being produced, like connectors for iPhones, and memory chips, and on and on and on. Well. The tube manufacturing industry doesn't really participate in that, um, that uh, that sort of clearinghouse of nomenclature where it's all kind of regulated and everybody's sort of keeping that playing field even. Mm -hmm. That level of oversight doesn't exist for vacuum tubes anymore, and so all the people that make vacuum tubes just arbitrarily assign a name on it to get you to think that it's doing a thing that it isn't actually doing. Like, for example, a KT88, well, you know, we made the heater current a little higher, or we made the plate plate dissipation uh, capacity a little more. And so we're going to call it a KT120 because it has more. More of what? Well, a power tube 
because it's capable of being used in a circuit that will produce 100 watts isn't doing it because it said KT100 on it. <laughs> it's doing it because it was designed to do oh, that. On. So when somebody takes a KT88 and puts the number 100 on it, that didn't make the tube 20% more powerful. It just gave them a reason to make another tube with another name on it. A lot of times it's just the glass is thicker so that when you wow. drop it, it doesn't crack. Wow. Um, they're going to swear up and down that, um, that A, it's going to produce 30% more power. Can you like how my, my antenna shake when I say that? 30% more power. And when they do that, do they furnish you with the specs? Uh, well, see, that's the problem. Uh, they don't tell you that it, a tube will only perform a certain way under certain electronic conditions. The, ah, pl the plate yes. voltage, the plate current, the heater current, all of these kinds of things. But when you ask for the specs, they give you a copy of the, the KT88 specs from 1965 and say, well, it's kind of like this except more. More what? Might as well be a yeah. copy of Oatmeal Enthusiast Right. Magazine. So on the, if, in fact, a KT120 by a specific manufacturer actually is doing as it's implied, producing, being capable of producing or handling 30% more dissipation than a KT88, it's because it has to be in an amplifier that has more plate voltage da, da, da. and more power supply current handling capacity to enable the tube to be able to do that. So putting those tubes in putting KT120s in a deliverance isn't going to make it 30% more powerful. It's just going to basically give you a set of tires that you can inflate to 45 pounds per square inch rather than 38 pounds per square inch. If you get the analogy, it's, it can't produce more power unless you give it more energy to convert to power. And that doesn't happen just by switching the tube. You have to switch the power supply. You have to change the output transformer. You have to change the bias. It's change everything. So, will the KT will the KT one twenty eight work in a deliverance? Sure. Will it make it more powerful? No. Will it, you perceive it to be more powerful? I don't know. It depends on what how you perceive power. If it sounds clearer and brighter, will you think that that means it's more powerful? If the bass sounds tighter, maybe it's just got better definition in the low end, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's putting in more power. You can't really say that unless it's, you can actually test it and demonstrate that it's doing that. And I guarantee you that the specs that you get from the manufacturer for that tube will not have anything in there indicating that that is so. So they should just stop saying shit like that because it's misleading and it leads me to go on rants like this. So, um, I need a mic for you to drop. After yeah, this. yeah. Well, this is why I like doing this show. <laughs> I, I see the industry is riddled with stuff like that. But I mean, I mean, that's a roundabout answer. But that's thorough as hell. Like that's the real deal. That's the only way it works. There, there, there's no company making vacuum tubes that that violate the laws of physics it's just they're not i mean doing how it. many times have you you know when you put a tube in and it does have a tighter low end or whatever you're used to an amp that's crapping out it and it's power band you're like oh that's that kind of clipping down there that's what happens when it's running out of juice you just internalize that so if you put a tube in there that has a different response down there you're thinking oh well, it must be putting out more power because it's not behaving the ex exact same way. And you know what? Right? And you know what? A lot of the time, you're experiencing that because you're putting new tubes in an amplifier that you haven't changed the tubes in in five years. And that was one of the biggest things that launched GT. Is like, here's a guy promoting that if you buy these tubes, your amp will have my perp. By golly, I put those tubes in my amp, and it sounds cleaner and clearer now. Well. Yeah, you didn't change your tubes for five years, did you, before you did that? Well, that's kind of funny because when he came along, it really kind of was like, here's the thing that you need to do now that you never knew you needed that's to do exactly until right. I came along. Yeah, this is like, it's like boy, I checked my star belly sneakers. After I got that new Groove Tubes motor oil, I put it in there, and I pulled the stick out, and crap, it was all clean. Right. <laughs>
When was the last time you changed your oil? Well, it was only 15,000 miles ago. I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. That is really a problem in the what I call the two black market because, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I'm going to drop a little truth on here. There's a woman engineer at the Expo Pole Factory in Russia who is the one that actually is managing what these tubes that are being produced for new sensor are and how they behave and what and knows if they start getting a lot of rejects where to go look on the production line for where the failure mode is okay and uh they're not out there spending hundreds of thousand dollars doing research development on new tube types to that are going to be a boon to tube amplifier mankind. They're not doing that. They're just figuring out new ways to remarket existing designs to get you to buy more of them. That's all that is. And I'm sorry to burst your bubble. And um, thank you for listening. All right. Have a sip and then uh, get another question. Okay. Give this a shot. I run a looper pedal through my FX loop of my Deliverance 120 uh, Series 2. Why is it that with my master volume down and my loop playing, it still plays at full power? I cannot control the level of my effects. Put that question up so I can see it. Sure. I loop it through the effects loop in Deliverance 120 with my master volume down and my loop Oh, 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 the loop is still plays full power. Can't control the level. Well, that implies to me, if I'm reading this correctly, that you created a loop and then you changed your master volume setting to a lower level, but the loop that you created at the higher level is still at that level. That's because that's the looper pedal is basically a recording device. Right. And the level at which you record that loop is the level at which it's going to play it back. If you change the amplifier's volume, you're changing the master volume, which is before the loop. And, <laughs> and therefore, if you turn down the master volume level, you're just turning down how much signal is going to go through the looper the next time and out to your speakers, uh, whatever is stored in the loop pedal is stored at the level that you recorded it at. Still it's screaming. Gonna play it at that. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, that is an issue. And the problem with that is, the solution to it is to put the master volume after the loop. Okay, then what happens? The very first thing that happens is everybody's like going, when I turn my when I turn my pedal on, it's totally getting compressed and distorted, because you're sending too much level to it. The master volume is regulating the signal going to the effects loop and thereby to the pedal, to make sure that you have a level that's not overdriving the pedal in the loop. So you have to have the master volume before that so that you don't overload the pedal. The downside is is if you're using it for a loop, uh, if you're using it with a looper that's going to be the that's going to be the um the catch mm -hmm. and, and you'll you know if you look at david torn's rig he's got the the rig that he plays through to get his sounds and then he's got another rig that plays the loops that he creates getting those sounds yeah. so he's got his pedals he's got his amp he creates these loops but the looper is playing back through a separate system Right. And that's how you can. It's almost like that. he's got a guitar rig that he's recording and then manipulating it. Right. It's almost like a miniature recording studio in right. a sense. Right. right. Yeah. He's overdubbing himself. Yeah. So you have to play yeah. it back. Yeah. Through separate rigs. Through a separate rig and then yeah. accompany that rig. Right. That's, the, that's the way you have to do that. All right. Awesome. That was um, a good question, by the way. I actually had to use my brain on that. I haven't been, uh, I'll start putting all these up. 
Have you ever worked with a Baxendahl tone circuit? And uh, what do you think of it, if you know it? Uh, well, that's one of those. That's one of those things that that advertising people love to make uh, a point of. Oh, it's got the Baxendahl circuit. Like, it's another marketing catchphrase these days. The Baxendahl circuit was a equalization design and it was created in the days when equalization first started becoming a thing okay way back in the development of audio processing and the idea <coughs> was that uh these the audio uh the audio industry is developing and people are coming up with ideas and some of these ideas become standard like uh, the um, the um, the equalization circuit by which records are made. So when an LP when an LP was made, there would be uh, a certain amount of audio information that you're trying to cut into the grooves of a record. Mm -hmm. If you cut uh, if you cut the the master disc at a full frequency range, the bass grooves would be this wide and the treble grooves would be this wide, and you would only be able to get about one third of the information onto the disc yeah. because of that. So the solution for that was an equalization network, which did this. They rolled off the low end and rolled off the high end or accentuated the high end actually. I have to remember because I haven't looked at one of those for a while, but the equalization network jimmied the frequency response going to the LP so that you could jam the grooves closer together and right. get more information on it. The tr it was just like compression. The trick is that when you play the record, you have to play it through the reverse anagram of that filter network going into the record to restore it back to its original frequency response. I didn't know any of this. This is interesting. And that's called the RIAA Record Industry Association of America uh, Equalization Curve. Huh. And, uh, uh, and that stayed really constant over decades and decades of making albums. It was refined a little bit, you know, after about 30 years or something. But essentially, an, an RIAA curve is an industry standard used to enable the efficient uh, production of the LP, the vinyl LP. Box adult circuit is a different kind of thing, but the same kind of thing in that uh, for audio playback and reproduction, uh, it recognizes that at different volumes, your ears respond differently to oh, high yeah. frequencies and low frequencies. You talk about this a lot. That's right. So uh, what the purpose of the box and doll tone circuit was for was as you turn the volume down, you would turn the treble up and the bass up to compensate for that so it still sounded flat. And if you played it louder, you would turn, them, turn those controls down to either flat or even back them off a little bit because uh, your ears were sensitive enough that they didn't need the extra help of the boosting of the top right. and the bottom you again get fatigued again to try to simulate uh, try to get back to what the ears perceived as flat response so that you would you your brain would get a correct <coughs> uh sense of the, the 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 program material that was being presented to your ears so that you could hear it and go oh that's the music and the sound that i recognize okay right. so uh that's all the box and doll circuit is is a way to cut or boost the high frequencies and cut or boost the low frequencies in accordance with the behavior of your ears. That was the original concept of the box and doll circuit. It was the original concept of any tone control circuit. The box and doll one just did a little better job of pinpointing the areas where you would want to cut or boost to okay. really make it palatable for most listeners. Mm -hmm. And uh, tone controls that came after that 
started to be get started to get modified in reaction to in response to the changes in the industry, which is guitar amps are being made. Some nutcase in Fullerton is deciding that the <laughs> mid range is getting in the way of the, the the horns and the vocals, so we need to back that off a little bit and jack up the treble and the bass oh, so that the guitars would fit in blend in with the band better. And uh, this it turned out that this guy's name was Leo Fender, and he kind of <laughs> struck upon an idea, made some guitar amplifiers around it, and then somebody goes, "Wow, that Boxendel circuit, that's like way better than that that monstrosity that's in the Fender amp." Well, the Fender amp tone control circuit serves a specific purpose. The box and doll tone control circuit serves a specific purpose. Some people use the box and doll circuit in amplifier tone control circuits, Ampeg being one of them, and there were others, primarily because they didn't have the technical chops to design their own, mm. or they weren't like OCD people like Leo Fender who had a vision and ears and could hear what a band was doing, what a live mix sounded like, and how he could manipulate this circuit to be not necessarily accurate, but appropriate to the application. And that's where you see a disparity, uh, a, 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 diver a diversion from this being a tool to aid the listening experience and now becoming a tone coloring tool to aid in the development of this new guitar amplifier technology. The guitar pickup, uh, the bodies kind of, the wood <coughs> bodies kind of mid rangey, mm -hmm. you know, not a lot on the bottom end or the top end. If you make the guitar pickup have better bass response, it picks up more hum. And then this other guy at Gibson, he's kind of a psycho too. <coughs> he goes, well, well, you know, the way to get rid of all that, that hum when you try to Seth. get more bass response is to flip the, make two of the pickups and flip them uh, opposite each other and wire them together and they'll cancel out that hum. Great. Okay, that solved that problem. But um, uh, now uh, we have this other kind of amplifier that's really mid-rangey and we need more gain and all these kind of things develop as a result of just the morphing of the industry uh, in electronic design and music production and musical trends and all these things that all they all sort of follow each other so and then after decades of that somebody goes along oh hey you know what what's you know what's really bitching about our ants we got that box and all tone circuit in there well great then you go and look at the schematic and you went, well, it is a box and doll, but it's actually a modified box and doll. They took the the high frequency component of the box and doll circuit and and expanded it so that now it bleeds it, it covers down farther into the mid range. Mm. It delves farther into the mid range and gives you a different mid range character, more more manipulation of the of the mid range than than a, the classic box and doll. And yeah. the same thing on the bottom end. Yeah. Well, let's really jet. We need a little bit more bottom end boost out of this. Okay, well, you extend the, you increase the low frequency extension of that circuit by manipulating some of the components, and then it becomes a modified box and doll circuit. And I think a lot of people just like to throw a word, the word box and doll around, but in, the reality is it's just another way of doing a tone stack these days. Uh, and so you really have to ask the question in the context of what are you asking in the context of hi-fi, music reproduction, record cutting, uh, guitar amplification, bass amplification. I think they actually are more practical as a bass amp EQ because, um, mm. you know, what you're really trying to do with a bass amp is, is not the same thing that you're trying to do with a guitar amp. With a guitar amp, you're really trying to enhance and extend the behavior of the guitar so that you get feedback, you get better sounding distortion, you get this and that. Bass players generally want fidelity, power, and uh, you know full frequency response. You know, and they don't want the amplifier interfering with the sound of the instrument. Some people don't. Jack Bruce would argue with you, and. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is where 
the question then becomes academic. What's the application? Very well done. That's, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, all right. Here's another question. I've been a PS2A owner for a couple of years and love it. But now I'm starting to look at your amps for the first time. What was your inspiration for designing the deliverance model? I kind of know, and I think okay, you, you talked that about one. it. Well... I mean, to me, the thing that always stands out to me is, is that it was essentially your answer to, hey, when are you going to do like an 80s Marshall thing? When are you going to do a JCM 800 kind of thing? When are you going to do your take on a JMP? Yeah, and you went, um, how about I don't do that, but I do my idea of what would stomp all over one. Mm. Am I correct about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, in, in broad strokes. In broad strokes, sure, sure. You know, and and also, I think that was the amp where you took a look at what you'd done and you said, you know what, we have a lot of stuff that the all of these amplifiers do, mm -hmm. a lot of functions, and was Erico involved in this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, saying. Was. Hey, you know, people go, well, what's the Fryat sound? These amps can do a lot of different things, but what's the Fryat sound? And you're going, well, it's, it's always been in all of the amplifiers, but let's make it crystal clear and well, take away all of that stuff. She actually pulled a fast one on me. She said, what is the, what is the Fryat sound? And uh -huh. I'm like, well, it's that. Yeah, well, what is that? I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting put on the toaster now. Fine. Um, but... In essence, what she was saying was, I listen to records. She's a, she's a musician. Mm -hmm. She is a, uh, a music aficionado. She's got great ears, and she's got specific tastes. Mm -hmm. So she's able to make a delineation between different kinds of sounds and, and then like guitar players, how did they get those sounds? So, and then, and then she progresses from that to, okay, I can tell when I'm listening to a Marshall amp on a record. I can tell when I'm listening to a Mesa Boogie amp on a record. I can tell when I'm listening to a Fender amp on a record. I don't know about Vox so much. I don't know about Ampeg so much. Um, but I know that the amps that we make, or like the amps that Wagner makes, for example, or some of these other companies, I know that they make us, they specialize in a particular area, but I don't really know how that specialization manifests itself. So what is it that we're doing that's so effing special? And I have to go back and revisit my brain and say, well, you know, there were things in all of those that I felt needed to be fixed. And expanded upon so um while i would like a particular characteristic of one amplifier mm -hmm. that was too narrow of a definition because mm -hmm. i wanted the in-between area with regard to gain or low end response and then i also wanted something i wanted to do something about the top end doesn't have to be specifically this or the power amp distortion doesn't have to be specifically this. With Marshall, it's just like you always know where you're going to get that Marshall saturation sound. <coughs> that's going to be that. And the high watt one is going to be that. And never the twain shall meet. But somewhere there is a blend there where you get the kind of saturation that works for you musically and the kind of detail and articulation that works for you uh, intrinsically. And it doesn't necessarily mean that Oh, you're just blending, and somebody's going to take this, and they're going to interpret it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're just talking about blending High Watt and Marshall, and that's what Fry oh. is now. No. Oh, that's all you've ever done. Yeah, <laughs> and that's not it at all. There is the onset of distortion, and then the decay and the bloom after the note. And what kind of frequency blend, when you hit a power chord, is it that makes the hair on my arm stand up when I hear that? And I needed an amplifier to hear that. So, yes, in a way, 
are the the Freyette sound is not as easily defined or pigeonholed as other amps because it's a little less specific, but it is a broader sonic picture. And then she says, okay, well, what amp, take one of our amps and set it up to what you consider is the, uh, the essential Fryat sound. I want to hear that and I want to hear what you do with it. So I took, I think it was a CLX head at the time, which is an EL3, the EL34 version of the Ultra Lead, and played through it and played, I set it up the way I like it. And then she said, uh, okay, so play, uh, um, play a Sex Pistols song. And I played a Sex Pistols song. She goes, yeah, that sounds like Sex Pistols. Okay, play a Credence song. And I played a Credence song. She goes, yeah, that sounds like Credence. And then play this and play that. A few exercises. And then she was like, I didn't see you change any of the knobs on the amp to get through those different sounds. And I said, that's the Fryhead sound. It has the range and the capacity for to to give you this range of 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 uh, expression without having to do this to the amp all the time. Mm. And if, but if you needed to make bigger jumps from one uh, mo to another mo, then you really needed to go to a different channel and set that up differently to get into a little bit different of a universe. Yeah. And that's why they were channel switching. But if you didn't have any of that, if you just had one amp that covered the range of expression that you're talking about, what would be the base setup that you would use? And that's what I did. And she said, okay, my vision is that should be the thing that we try to convey to the end user and we should have a model that specifically does that without all the other bells and whistles that they think they want because that's not going to get them any closer to where they're trying to get than just having an amplifier that gives them that sonic expression in the first place right so that is what gave rise to the deliverance it was her vision that we needed an amplifier that explained that that um, that mission just by plugging guitar into it and go, oh, I get it. So, um, Erico is um, double checking your work right here. Right. Well, you. I'm sure she's going to want to, um, you know, expand upon that and well. and uh, you're certainly welcome oh, to do that. Oh, I think I know what's happening. <laughs> So let's let's see if I articulated that clearly enough for the person who actually had that original thought in the first place. Well, because we are so pissed about the that um, here or here or here or here. Why did it stop? We got stalled. What happened? Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's get you here? over okay. here. There we go. Hi, Nico Chan. Hello. Well. Because we are so pissed of the uh, customer, uh, artist, I don't remember who that was. It was the black clothes. I don't remember. Somebody um, in black. Okay. That, that narrows it down. Uh, <laughs> um, the black Sabbath, black you know, crows, Johnny Cash. Our amplifier has so much knob and it's channel switching. Mm -hmm. And said, so, well... Anybody can make the sound if you have that much switch and channel. So that means you, that that means you guys don't have a sound or some, something like mm, that. Mm. And then I was so pissed when I heard from that customer. Was that the was that the guy for Nine Inch Nails? No, no, no. I don't remember. Don't don't say don't say no no don't say I, I don't I don't I don't know anymore. Yeah, I don't I don't remember who that was, but the, I was so pissed about it. And and then I ask you. That's a good moment right there. I ask you, what is our amplifier sound? People said with the three channel amp with the channel switching. I mean I mean uh, uh, three channel with the the all those. Flipping knobs and mm. uh, push buttons and kind of stuff, and so so many sounds, so many stuff. And you guys don't have any character or something like that. Mm. I was so 
so mad about it. Mm. I'm going to ask you, what is our sound? And then you told me, tones is not an in, in amplifier. Tones on your finger. If you are an experienced person, you want to know how to, what to make or how to make. You, you, you love the sound. <laughs> you know what tone you wanted to make. <laughs> if you know what kind of tone you wanted to make, then your finger should remember. Your brain should remember. Hmm. You just have to, to uh, practice to... Um, if you hear it in your head, you can play it. You can recreate. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what kind of gear. <coughs> mm -hmm. And we are making those gears so easy to to people to recreate their sound because tones on the finger. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. but a lot of people is complain about uh, our amplifiers, the too many knobs and too many uh, switching. Can you do it without all those knobs and Channel. I said absolutely, and of course. And then you said, yeah, of course. That's the Th easy that's part. The, that's the start, starting point. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I remember the first time I visited the shop, first or second time, I had... <laughs> Bye, Nico-chan. Um, this is before or after we threw you out? Is this time? No. <laughs> threw me out? No, never mind. Um, I didn't have any experience with your stuff. That's right. And I had heard all the normal stuff. These are metal amps, you know, whatever. And when I showed up, you were playing cream through, I don't even know what head. But I was like, this is, sounds like fucking Clapton. Mm. You were playing like a solo. Crossroads. Crossroads, yeah. You were playing the, like, the solo note for note. <laughs> Yeah, I did. And I was like, what? I was a little obsessive about that, I admit, yeah. Oh, okay. But um, that was, you know, a, a ding, ding, ding moment for me, mm. you know, thinking that I was just walking into a room full of, you know, chuggity chugga brutes. Well, the first time you came in, we you came in when we were screwing around with the, the GPDI. And the LX2 and the power station were mm -hmm. all... Floating around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What you got there? I got the like the bitchinest junk box guitar on the planet. So we got the we got Buzz's new bridge. Mm hmm Anything else since the last time I saw it? So, um, this is a guitar that a lot of you already know about. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I built this in, in uh, 1980. In 1872. Yeah, from junk parts, except a nice, a nice pickup. And the rest of it was just parts I scavenged everywhere. And uh, it eventually got a, a, a new neck made for it because the neck <coughs> that, I, that I had scavenged was okay, but it wasn't great. So when I had some extra dough... I had a friend of mine who's a really good luthier. Uh, I had him uh, build me a neck that was suitable for it. And then uh, I dinked around with it a little bit and made changes over the years. But for the most part, it's basically stayed an Esquire with a 68 Kelly pickup in it. And um, I think the neck that I'd gotten for it originally had these... Um, whatever the tuning gears were on it. And so the, when the guy made the new neck, I just said, use those same tuning gears off of that neck and put them on here. And he was like, yeah, all right. Um, and the, it pretty much stayed that way for the last 20 years. And then uh, I was never really super thrilled with the neck. And I was talking to Bruce Nelson, who is uh, Dean DeLeo's guitar tech, among other people. Uh, and, and he built his own and a long time friend guitars. of mine and now he builds his own guitar is called Nelson he's been on the show he's been on the show and he looked at the neck and played it and he goes I know exactly what I need to do to this and it had I didn't like the finish on the neck because I know exactly what to do with that so 
I've known him long enough. And I said, okay, we'll just take it and do it. And that was the first time I'd really done anything since the neck. And after he gave it back to me, it was just like wonderful to play. And I played it at a gig and I was just having so much fun playing it. Then when I get, when that gig was over, I asked him to, to what else do you think that we should do? And he says, well, I think it's probably fine the way it is. And you might want to change the tuning gears. And he told me about these these Clues and Deluxes. They'd gone back and retooled their gearing so that they're much more accurate and smoother. And they, they look uh, just like the old ones. They look exactly like the old ones, but the gears have a have a more accurate mesh, That's and there's awesome. no backlash on them. And um, Buzzy Featon had told me about those too. Now Buzzy had has recently developed a new bridge <coughs> that he called me about and wanted some feedback from me on it, and I and I played a couple of the instruments that he'd done that bridge on and I'm like well this is like the coolest shit and uh, I said why don't you come on the show and we'll talk about it and um, and I said and just for chits and giggles what uh, would you be able to put that, uh, that bridge on this guitar without changing anything else like I give you another bridge to modify or whatever he goes oh yeah yeah I'll keep all your original hardware my whole concept now is it it should just be able to drop in, and if you don't like it, you can just put the original back on, and, and no extra holes drilled, no harm done. I went, perfect. So he put it on a guitar, and it turned it into this magical instrument. And then Bruce came over about a week ago, and he had been wanting to check out the guitar since I had done that. Yeah. And he played it, and he played a few, <laughs> he played a, he played a few open chords and a few dyads, acoust dyads acoustically. He didn't even plug it into an amp, and he went, this thing is freaking amazing. Yeah, and I said, okay, well, so can you, uh, can you put those clusins that you're bragging about on there, and can you do it by Friday so I can have it for the show this weekend? He says, yeah, no problem. So he took it, and he came back two days later with these, and they look like they're aged. He aged them. They don't come oh, that he way. He did. He aged them. Freaking Bruce. And now when you look at it, it's just like, you know, be, even before. He changed those when Buzzy first opened the case. Mm. He was just like, "What do we got here?" He was like, uh, "I said, it's don't be fooled. It's it. I've been using it for forty years. You know, I mean, uh, of course it looks vintage. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's just not anything that you, you would <laughs> it, recognize. It ain't lying. And um, anyway, so he put these tuning gears, and I got it back, and it's just like it was the last piece." I don't have to do anything else to this guitar as long as I live. It's just so phenomenal the way it is. I just I just play an E chord on it and I'm happy for the rest of the day. I can just play one E chord, put it back in the stand, and go back and do the rest of my day. And... Well, play us a freaking riff on there, man. Well, um, you got a riff? I don't. I I've been trying to think of a riff. You want to think of a riff? Yeah. Well, the actually there we're talking. To, I don't know. There's there's a play there, um play there's, uh, there's a riff that I think of, but I don't want to do it on this guitar because I can't get the idea across of what's weird about it on this guitar. I'd have to have a strat where I can oh. tweak the pickup height, and then I could talk about that. But wow. um, you, what, what do you want me to? What, do you, you want me to? Um, well, you you, you start to you start starting to say something like play. Uh, oh, I just uh, I think. Everybody wants to hear that guitar. You know, so I was thinking maybe you should play a riff. You know what I really like? What is it? Um, um, I like the guitar solo on Outside Woman Blues because it's such a funny little solo. Oh. It's one of Clapton's most understated but really finely executed guitar solos. It's not amazing wow. It's just one of these little curmudgeonly little guitar solos that it sounds like he's fishing around for ideas while he's doing it mm. and the execution is not fine it's just what it is and it well, every time I listen to it, it just makes me smile because it's so spontaneous and practically nothing but cool because it's just so thrown off the shoulder like I could have done this in a coma yeah and it holds up so well after all this time hmm. over practically nothing. So that's what I dig about it. 
And and by the way, I did work out a preset where I can have um, I can have the microphone going and um, have the sound happening um, without turning off the vocal mic. Now I just oh hey Bruce, this yes. hey Bruce. That's all I gotta say. Come back. Come on again. Uh, let's see, am I on the right piece of Yeah, I am. So, you guys are hearing it out there. I'm just not hearing it here. But now I am. Do you have to mute the mic in order to play? No, I actually don't. So we can comment. At that level. It won't be back. Okay. With well, it talking like sex or something. But I mean, everybody knows this. And I got a lot of gain, but I can turn the gain way back and get that. You know, that sort of gut bucket, a little kind of sound. That's not the part that's cool about it. Okay. The part that's cool about it is the guitar solo. All right. It plays along with the breaks, but, well, you'll hear it. Goofy little thing, right? <laughs> I just like seeing how happy you are playing. Okay, so I'm just gonna play all the. I'm not gonna play the fill part. I'm just gonna play the <laughs> solo by itself. such a throwaway and it's not terrible it's not the the woman tone yeah it's just a little almost kind of a freddie king sort of a vibe i hear that right hear that. Yeah. right yeah. and i've got this really trebly sound because i barely got the volume i've got a high gain setup going this is how much gain i'm actually using it. I can actually get it a little more. This is a little bit more saturated sound. But <coughs> with the guitar volume barely cracked open and this little tone control popped out. <coughs> That same sort of vibe yeah. that, that that Jimmy Page has, where it was almost the the expression of what the solo was saying, rather than the tone, was the most important part. Of it. You, it could have been any tone. Oh, it sure. was kind of like a rinky-dink tone. Yeah. It wasn't this huge, gainy, bloody, you know, 
uh, rich, yeah. thick, woman whatever. It was just this rickety little tone. <laughs> Same kind of tone as on this, this riff. When he plays that, when he does that second, second descending bit, yeah. and by the way, you played that a couple of weeks ago, and you said I'm not playing right. You know what you were doing wrong? You were playing the parts right, but I played cashmere. Yeah, you played that part, and you were going, that doesn't sound right. You you weren't playing the open strings on the on the top. That's what was what that was was missing. You were playing instead of this. You know the yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. And but. the way they, the way that, the way that riff, the way that descending chord pattern resolves is a bar, a, um, a, uh, a note in the bar gets drops. doesn't do the first one, right? The second one, right? And that's kind of a, when I listened to him, him play that, demonstrating how he played that song, he was just using a, a not special amp. Mm -hmm. And just a medium amount of gain with a little bit of sparkle on the top, and it was like, well, that's the sound. <laughs> and, and the, the, the I great think thing that, about that was the Dan Electro, yeah, guitar too, right? But the great thing about the is just drop it into a D, and it sounds fucking new. Even on the, I mean, guys, I, mean, I have the volume, the guitar volume. On so much is that it's so resonant and with this buzz bridge now it's so resonant and musical that it doesn't matter if I'm using no overdrive or shit tons it still has this chiming ringing thing going on so that's that's my riff, two riffs for the day I love that now um, I hate to be a party pooper but um, my whatever it is I'm dealing with is kicking in okay I'm going to have to um, wrap this up on my end. You're you're free to keep going, man. No, Nico no, no. Nico Chan come sit in my seat. Is there is there one more? Is there one more well, question? We had, we had um, that we really need to address. Here's one that I want to address because um, we've kind of been asked this Almost twenty. Well, the new thing with the power station work with the existing power station. Yes, Bingo. absolutely. Yeah. Previously, I asked you a question about. Man, wind is blowing like crazy. Um, and <clears throat> I apologize if we have which one. 
Who's the name? We were just answering that question, but there's this guy asking again about the, this guy. This is the same guy. Oh, the deliverance is not up on the site anymore. Is it discontinued? Um, no, it's not discontinued. Um, the reason it's not on the site anymore is because the new release version of it is going to be up there in a couple of weeks. So we'll have a lot to say about all that when that comes to pass. And um, probably two shows from now, I think we'll actually feature it and talk about it and, and mess with it. Wow. It's, it's done. It's, it's in production. We're going to start announcing it and there's going to be the guys doing reviews on it and playing it and demoing it. And that's going to be happening in the next few weeks. So it's coming. It is awesome. It is, there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot to talk about and not much to talk about at the same time because it's just, it's just an enhancement <laughs> and an evolution of what it was and it just got a little better and nicer and more fun to play. <laughs> I think um, Mark earlier on when we said we were going to do these once a week, uh -huh. he's like, oh, great, more opportunities to say. There's nothing else to comment on. No comment. <laughs> yeah, and I apologize. That. It's, just, it's just the timing. I mean, we're, we're not Amazon. We're not Fender. We don't have 800 people on staff. And, uh, you know, we do our thing the way we do it. And we apply a really high level of <coughs> exactitude, if that's a word I can use, to, to getting it just right and having it make sense and having it be bulletproof and reliable and fun to play and all these kind of things. And, and the industry is, is crazy. It's, and the, it's, a, it's very challenging to get this stuff to happen and, and have it happen the way you want it to happen. And the more hardcore you are about getting everything just right, the more the universe like throws rocks at you to see if they can knock you off the log and you know it's like our motto is not like no f you we're going to do this and we're going to do it our way we're going to do it right and come hell or high water come hell or high water it's going to happen and it's going to happen so yeah so next next week we'll figure out something to talk about where we don't have to like play hide and seek with with <laughs> with uh, what's going on because we just don't want to give you any uh you know un <sighs> expectations that we can't live up to you know we want to be able to be good to our word when we say we're going to do something and that's where it's at understood thanks a whole lot for hanging well happy new year amen and uh, great to see you great to great be to doing this you. we actually got through a, a whole show without a single audio glitch can you fucking believe it that's going to screw everything up now we're going to be all we're going to be all all full of ourselves because we got through a show without a single audio weirdo thing i could happening. i could play the the gorilla fart clip again yeah you sure could but i won't oh okay Unless you want me to. No, no. I thought you were going to close with that, but you played it. So now, you, well, now what are you going to go Now what are you going to go to? Um, <laughs> I think we're finished, right? Yeah. We'll see you a week from now. Thanks for hanging. Is that it? That's, that's it. That's it. All right, you guys. Thanks so much. <laughs> see you next week.